What's happening, everyone? It's Kira and Ben back after a very long break. I'm so sorry. Um, it has been personally all me. I've been incredibly sick. As you know, Ben and I both work retail, so when a sickness runs through the store, it kind of just runs through it. And I was its latest casualty. So thank you guys for your patience. Um, we are gonna dive back into Oscar movies. I know the Oscars have already happened. I hope everyone watched. They were amazing. Ben, did you watch? Uh, no, I had to work. Oh, I mean, classic. I had to work, too, but I did record them. <laughs> OK, so today is going to be the holdovers. Um, ben, tell me now. I know I saw this movie in theaters. I was incredibly excited for it. Um, but tell me your history with it. So I knew nothing about this movie. Um, what it was was Mike from Trader Joe said, have you seen the holdovers? It's an amazing movie. And I said, uh, yeah, no, I haven't. He goes, well, you got to see it. So I ended up watching it and uh, he was right. It was it was awesome. It was awesome. Paul Giamatti, Devane Joy Randolph, and Dominic Cesar, really, they're the main hearts of this m movie. Um, I will say, I do think Devine Joy Randolph is the full heart of this movie. Her performance, um, as you guys know, she has won Best Supporting Actress in for every award that she was nominated for. She had a clean um, award season sweep. Yeah, her performance was amazing. Like I, I watched the movie, and I was watching it, and... I mean, her scenes come up and she was talking about the you know the death of her son if you haven't seen it her her son dies and he, he goes to the school that they're at but uh, he was in the war and uh or military and he ends up dying and there's a scene where she breaks down and like i was like tearing up i'm like oh my god i totally understand oh my god and that was so crazy i was like to portray this level of like hurt and like realism i thought was insane so like so i saw the movie um with both my mom and my dad and we were talking after and I was like, and my mom asked me the question. She goes, I believe, she goes, do you think she really lost a child? Because you can't, you can't just imagine that sort of pain. And I said, I have no idea, but I think she's a great actress. Yeah, I don't know nothing about her personal life and, you know, anything like that's tragic. So, um, but her performance made you think that, good God, it seemed like it actually really happened to her. So, uh, yeah, she, she, she had me hooked. I, I'm, I'm sold on her. She knocked it out of the park. I feel like everyone actually honestly knocked it out of the park. Paul Giamatti had been nominated um, in everything. Uh, he did win the Golden Globe, but I thought his performance, again, was amazing. Um, I know you didn't watch the Oscars. I did. So uh, for those of you who also did not watch the Oscars, the way that they presented Best Supporting and Best Actor and Actress this year was they had five other winners present and do the little speeches for the new nominees and Nick Cage did Paul Giamatti's and he was talking about the methods of acting and um, Paul Giamatti has a lazy eye in this film and he actually wore a glass eye throughout like all of filming he put like a glass like film over his eye and he ended up started going like a little blind oh that's awful I mean you know you got to give everything for your your, your, your role. Yeah, yeah, your role, but good God, not losing an eye. I know. Well, he does, his eyesight's back. His eyesight's back, but I thought that was funny. And I think if we look in, like, relation to, like, how praised his um, performance is, and then Bradley Cooper, who was also nominated for Best Actor for uh, Maestro, uh, he really he really put his all into it, and he kind of got no recognition. So I think I, I just think it's really funny how people will latch on to certain performances and people will – elevate certain performances and bring them up but let's talk about the film we can i can just talk about the acting forever but let's talk about the film so it is set in an all boys boarding school in right i think it's right outside of boston yes it's right outside of boston yeah so to me it kind of gave me like phillips exeter vibes like um very like elite boys academy and it follows paul giamatti who's like the kind of grumpy hard ass teacher that no one really likes the teachers don't really like him the students kind of don't like him he's kind of just like grumpy and smelly and but a great teacher full of knowledge and he really is passionate and he really does care about the kids um and i think this really comes through slowly throughout the film um through his forged friendship with angus and um Mary uh, Devane Joy Randall and then of course our main character is actually a young child Angus um, he is uh, the person that plays him is Dominic Ceza he is um, I think like only 18 or 19 years old and I think he actually went to the school and then just went to the open casting oh that's awesome because that was a, like he did a really good job he did a really good job and for it to be like his first kind of film kind of unknown coming into this I thought was um, I thought was really cool so I really liked their relationship. Um, this movie is very funny, 
But at the same points, I find incredibly touching and very sad. Yeah, there's one point where um, he says to a student, uh, the student says to him, I can't afford to, you know, fail this class. And he goes, oh, don't sell yourself short. You can fail you this can't class. You can't fail. <laughs> and, like, the little lines that Paul Giamatti had was so funny. Like, when he's talking to the um, the headmaster and he goes, you know, I was your teacher. I've known you for a long time, so I can accurately say that you're a dick. Like, I thought that was so funny. Yeah, yeah. There's some parts in this where I was just, like, chuckling. I thought this was great. The writing the writing was great, and there's a little controversy that came out right before the Oscars, um, so we're going to talk about that, too, but let's get more into the story. So the holdovers happens because... Obviously, sometimes all the boys don't get picked up for spring break, uh, not spring break, winter break. And um, Paul Giamatti is the teacher that has to hang out with them during this time. So he doesn't get to spend time. But it's kind of implied that he also doesn't have any family. So it's like, what else would he be doing? Which I kind of think is like a shitty way to look at it. Yeah. And isn't it because he's being punished, too? Like, Yeah, because they don't like him. And they're like, oh, yeah, you can do this. And. The, he doesn't have good relationships with the other people besides the two other main characters. So then Don, uh, Angus, Dominic says uh, he is kind of going through something. We don't really know what it is. Um, we see him looking at a photo longingly of like his mom and his dad. And we know that his mom just got remarried and like her new husband and doesn't really want him around. So they don't pick him up. He thinks that they're going to come pick him up and they don't. It's kind of like... That part was actually sad when he's on the phone call with them and she's like, oh, we're not coming. That broke my heart. Yeah. You know, it's it's like you, you put you're supposed to put your kids first. And in this, they, like the lady doesn't do that. And like a lot of parents, I guess, don't do that. But you're supposed to. But you're supposed to do that. Right. And I guess like so. Yeah. So then he's left behind and then uh, he's left behind with a bunch of other kids. And then one of the kids parents is like hey i'm gonna pick you guys all up and we're gonna go skiing now angus's mom does not pick up the phone so technically and legally um paul giamatti's character cannot let him go because it's like you're in my care of the school like i need your parents permission before you leave so now she does not pick up the phone call so he cannot leave so now it is just him paul giamatti and devane joy randall chilling on this campus trying to make the best of it and through that, they really start to understand each other and learn more about each other. Um, and they start to have this, like, really beautiful kind of found family relationship. Um, I think, like, some of the big points is when he takes them to Boston and they go to the museum and they go to the little bookstore. The part at the Christmas party I thought was really beautiful. And also when they're out to dinner and they're trying to get the bananas foster but they can't have it because there's alcohol in it and then they light it on fire themselves oh my god like th this movie is really touching and it's really beautiful but i would say like one of the best scenes and it's kind of not talked about and well i haven't seen it really talked about um is the scene where he goes to see his dad yeah that was kind of sad i was, I was like wow you know because he loves his dad and he, he remembers his dad when his dad didn't have like the form of dementia that he has so he has all those memories of his dad like with like you know normal 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 insight yeah and i think it too it's just really devastating to see like the person that like you love the most and is like wh what you consider like your protector and like your father and just having him not even recognize him, I thought was really devastating. And having him not like remember him because he's kind of has this moment of like, oh, dad, like we're going to get you out like me, you and mom, like we're going to be back together again. And the dad is just kind of talking to him like it's not his son, like he doesn't know who he is. Yeah. And it's tragic, like um, uh, personal life, like my wife went through something like that with her dad and um, it was awful to see the memory loss and just like the deterioration and like it is a tragic tragic situation and um in this movie i was kind of sitting back going oh you know something i can't watch with my wife because that would trigger her I, I, absolutely it is something that is so devastating i mean the mind is so powerful but at the same time can become is incredibly fragile um and i think we really see that and i think to watch this this child because he is he is a child he's in high school um to watch this child kind of be abandoned and forgotten and 
isolated from all these like parental and loving figures in his life is really devastating. You see him already get rejected from his mom and like her new husband. You see his father not even remember him. He doesn't have any like real friends that he like can connect to. And the only people that he has is Paul Giamatti and he keeps trying to run away from him. Yeah, there's a funny part where he uh he, the the gym's closed off because it's being re- remodeled and um, the floor's done and they can't he can't be in there at all and he runs and he jumps on this trampoline and like breaks his arm like and I thought that scene was so funny when they're just screaming in the car he's like what do you think would happen he's like drive faster I thought that was so funny because I think that it shows that like kind of like need for like adolescent like rebellion of like I know what I'm gonna do and I'm gonna do it and you be damned and then like does it and then is like oh my god you were right what was I thinking like now I'm in so much pain yeah, especially like afterwards when the janitor comes in, he goes, someone was in the gym. Do you know anything about it? But they all oh, lie. They They're all like, no, no. And he goes, oh, okay, well, you all can clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was so funny. And it was kind of like, because I think for the first time in Angus's life, he kind of had that like camaraderie and that like protection that he was always looking for. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine what it's like to grow up in extreme wealth where your parents ship you off for four years to go to school and like don't really see you i mean these are like your formative years yeah you know it's it's your building it's what you know, you're bonding with other people you're building and when you make friendships and stuff it's like moving like when you're a kid and you move to a different neighborhood or a different city or a different state but you leave all those behind and like all the people that you know and you know, it's it's sad and it's depressing. It's traumatizing because, you know, you had those relationships and you're like, we're going to stay in touch. And you never do because y- life goes on and life goes on and, and people change. And I think the way that like our lives like move and how we like connect with people and like how how like every little thing like affects it, I think is so is so interesting. This movie obviously was very critically well received. It's it, I think it has a 97 still on Rotten Tomatoes. I mean, everyone has loved it. Um, this is Alex. This is directed by Alexander Payne. You guys have probably know him from doing like Sideways and um, The Descendants. So he has worked with Paul Giamatti before. I also think he did the movie Downsizing, but I didn't. I didn't see that when they shrink Matt Damon. Did you see that? No, I didn't. Yeah. Who cares, Matt Damon? Eh, whatever. But oh, is that when they're going to a town to live in a town? Yeah, it's like the small town. Yeah, and they, it's it's to save on like the the, the food and everything. Like and like that. money and yeah, like yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I did see it. It was dumb. Yeah. Okay. So bad. But he comes back triumphantly with this film. I want to talk about right before the Oscars kind of happened. There was this sort of little plagiarism accusation that went after um, the script of that this movie was based on. So. Simon Stevenson had put in a complaint with the Writers Guild of America saying that he has submitted a script that forensically was so similar to um, the holdovers that he believes that they read it and then just changed some story points of it. I don't know how. I mean, I think the investigation is still going. I don't know how it's shaking out, but I think it's really interesting. And I kind of want to talk to you and talk about um, with this the idea of like submitting your work and 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 um, kind of giving your work to these bigger houses to to try to make a script out of. And if you don't copyright it or what does it take to change something enough to make it your own? Yeah, there's been like numerous cases of that like wasn't like Harlem Heat, Harlem Nights. Yeah, I think when, that was similar. Yeah, that Eddie Murphy got sued with yeah. that. And then um, what was it? The, the book, uh, Terry Goodkind. He said that he had shown the man that came out with the wheel of time that book series and he said oh it will never do anything and then he took it and made it for his own so terry goodkind came out with the seeker so i don't have to i don't know if any of this is true i don't want to get in trouble but this is the stuff that i've heard over time yeah and i think i think it's so interesting so i believe like okay so how so obviously there's something if you believe in it it's called the collective unconscious where this is why like trends happen and this is why certain things happen is because you're seeing a shift um, collectively through people of like what they're gravitating towards, right? Um, So obviously two people can have the same idea, right? That's not uncommon. There's billions of people in the world. Someone is bound to have the same idea. That's not what I'm saying. Oh, 100%. But at what point, at what point, 
can you change something enough to make it your own? Or if you're stealing the base of someone else's idea, was it ever your own? I mean, some people are just more talented and can recognize a good idea and make it something. And does that hold any merit? Yeah, like we kind of went through something like that a little bit a while back. Uh, uh, where was happening, WZ happening, and someone come out with uh, what's happening. And they were like, oh, well, that's ours. And I'm like, well, we were here for the beginning and uh, where was happening. We do movie reviews. We're nothing like you. You know, yeah. so uh, yeah. and if you're still out there, we're still better than you. Exactly. And where was happening, not what's happening. It sounds like a boring question. <laughs> <laughs> but but truly like if you look at it like what what can constitutes an original idea right because two people can tell a story about a dis a disillusioned older man and the friendship that he forges and like the relationship that he forges like with a younger person and how they kind of connect with each other and help each other i mean that seems like a pretty universal story to me yeah, 100%. I mean, how many books have you read where you go, oh, wait, this seems just like the other book I read before, and you have to go back and look at the different author, but it came out years later or years before. I mean, yeah, similarities are going to always be there because the world is big, but people, mind and conscience isn't. It, it, it's not. And I mean, one, one of my favorite examples of this, and you'll see it, like movies, similar movies will come out all the time from different houses. Like, vampires vampires but like if you look at like contact and armageddon that's basically the same movie told in two different ways 100 you have just friends and friends with benefits those are two of the same romantic comedies with different leads like you, th there's so much similarity because there's so many different ideas and there's so many creatives out there i mean i don't i don't know if alexander payne stole this if he did steal it I do think that's kind of bullshit that he didn't give at least writing credit to. It's not that hard to give credit, even if you like read a script. It's not hard to give credit. Yeah, I, uh, recently Katy Perry uh, got in trouble for taking the Christian rock band's music for um, what's her her big hit? She has so many. I don't know. Uh, the one with the lion. Oh, roar, roar. Yes. Yeah. So the music for that was actually from a Christian rock band, and uh, they had sued and won. Wow. I mean, and that's the thing. You got to copyright your stuff, people. Like, th there are laws like this for a reason. Um, but at the same point, like, it's not that hard, as I was just saying, to give credit. Like, Katy Perry obviously could have given credit. I mean, in music is very different from, like, writing. There are things called, like, sampling and interpolation. And, like, you can manipulate and use and skew parts of other songs to create, like, what you're looking for. That happens literally all the time. Um, but you it, it comes down to credit like you have to give people credit like and it's OK to say that like, oh, you know what? Like I had help with this. And that's what I don't understand. Yeah, I agree. Like you see a lot of it lately, like real a lot lately. Uh, blurred lines just got uh, a while back got sued for using. I want to say it was either Bob Marley or someone's someone's music. I mean, so you see it a lot in music and a, and a lot in art art. What's the old saying? Like, art repeats itself? Art does repeat itself. That's why we have trends. That's why we have, like... That's why everything comes full circle. That's why, especially, like, one of the best ways that you can look at this is fashion. Like, all fashion trends will, will repeat on, like, a 30 to 40 year cycle. That happens. It's okay. Give credit. So, if Alexander Payne really did steal this script, um, that's kind of shitty. But I will say, whatever parts that he took or added... It it, it it turned out to be a great movie. Yeah, I love the bar scene where the, the, he gets in trouble with the people playing pool. Oh, yeah. And, like, they're going to kick his ass. <laughs> and he has to go and, like, get saved by the teacher. It was, that was pretty funny. I thought that was funny, too, because it kind of shows how, like, he kind of has, like, this, like, smart-alecky, like, attitude and this kind of, like, kind of, like, wall up a lot of the times. And you can kind of see him always pushing people away because no one's ever really stuck around. And then we see Paul Giamatti sticking around and then we see Paul Giamatti fighting for him at the end when they want to, um, when they want to expel him and they're like, you, you can't do this. And Paul Giamatti actually lost his job to save him. I thought that was great. Yeah. You know, cause they were like, whose idea was it? And he was like, you know, thinking for a second, he was like, it's mine. It's mine. He, he was like, he did nothing wrong. None of them did anything wrong. This was all my idea. So he totally took it on the chin. Yeah, he did. And he was doing that because you can tell that like he didn't want 
like this boy was so lost he's just trying to find his dad he's just trying to find his place like he's just trying to carve out this like little bit for himself and and Paul Giamatti, I think, initially had a lot of respect for him because he was so smart and he was the only one that was doing well in his class. Yeah, I remember at the beginning they were talking trash about, the, about him, Paul Giamatti, and um, they're all together talking trash about him. But at the end, they come back from, from school and he's there um, and they, he's leave, Paul Giamatti's leaving. He's talking to the kid and the other kids like say something about him and he's like, no, he was a good teacher. Yeah, and I think, and I think that like kind of shows like because no one really respects Paul Giamatti as a teacher, but he's been the teacher there the longest. Like, obviously, he's a good teacher. And, I mean, it's not it's not about, like, pampering and kind of, like, coddling the, the, the like, rich, which is what I think happened. Happens. And then Paul Giamatti was kind of, like, the resistance against that. Like, he's like, I'm trying to build excellence, and I'm trying to build these boys up, and I'm trying to make them smart and, like, capable. And he does it in a very funny, sarcastic way with them. Yeah, a hundred percent. And there's one part where Paul Giamatti meets an ex colleague that went to college with him. What Princeton was it? And um, yeah, the, or Harvard. So, or Harvard. Well, it was a very Ivy League school. And uh, I guess he had gotten kicked out, and for wrong, for wrongful reasons, he got kicked out. But he took one on the chin for someone else. The guy's kind of judging him a little bit, and he's like, "Oh, you know, I do this and this." And then the uh, Dominic Sessa sticks up for him, and says, "Oh, well, he's writing a book, and he's doing a," and like he totally like f- like makes up this story to help out. Um, him and you know it was kind of cool it was cool and you kind of see that like that bond that they've been creating and this like kind of protection that they have for each other and this kind of like admiration that they have I mean Paul Giamatti realistically is like probably outside of his dad who he has like memories of is like the most stable parental figure like in his life and I mean to have him really like I think the moment is so beautiful it's between him and Devane Joy Randall when he's kind of like waiting for for his fate and she's kind of just like sitting next to him and they kind of just like hold hands and she's just there to comfort him it's like that's all he needs is like comfort and like a parent and like love and I think this story of like how when we're broken we kind of find these other broken people and we kind of help help one another put ourselves back together and I think that was what I really took away from this story and that's why I think I liked it so much yeah, when she did that, it reminded me of like the fact that her son died and she wasn't there for that. Yeah, and I think that was like her way of, you know, like like being there for him. Like it was like her, like come around. You know, of course, she, her biggest regret was that she wasn't. She was always there for her son, and they were best friends besides parent and mother. Uh, you know, son and mother, and um, like she talks about how she wishes she was there at the end with him to say goodbye. So when this is about to be this kid's goodbye, she's there with him. And it is a really beautiful moment. And I think that moment of like, especially like, I mean, I've never, I'm, I don't have a kid. I'm not, I don't have any kids in the military or anything. I've never lost a child. But I think too, when you can say goodbye to someone, there is a lot of that closure. But when it happens so far away and you're just hearing about it and that I feel would be incredibly isolating because like, in the scariest moment of like a person's life, like they want to be surrounded by like the ones that they love. And I don't think you get that in the army. And I don't, and I think that was implied here. And I think that guilt and that kind of like regret that she holds on, she really does. I think it's very cathartic for everyone. Yeah. uh, So I'm going to share something that's very sad and depressing for me. Uh, My junior year, I was going to school and my friend, I was coming back from lunch and my friend came up and said, your mom, was put into an ambulance. And I was like, oh. But my mom was sickly. She was always sickly and she always had to go to the hospital for something. So after school, I was walking up and so there was a bunch of people in front of my house and I was told that my mother had died. Uh, I was not there for her. I totally was like a basket case afterwards because, you know, I never got to say goodbye. Like my dad, he was at the hospital. They didn't tell him she had passed. He went looking for her, found her in the room with a blanket over her and like just lost it and came home. Uh, so being there for the person you love is probably one of the most important things in life and not being able to do that for like me and my dad was just like devastating. Ben, I'm so sorry. That is, that is absolutely devastating. Um, and kind of to like have that sort of like firsthand experiences. I don't know. Like, did you connect with certain parts of this film because of that? Well, so like when this happened, I, I left. I went to Lynn Woods and hung out in Lynn Woods for hours and uh, got drunk off my butt. 
when I came home, my dad had gone out with my aunt Cindy. He went out to sleep over there, so he wasn't alone. And I just remember sitting in the rocking chair, my mom's rocking chair, and I looked over and she had a pack of cigarettes. She used to always smoke uh, like old gold. And I just remember smoking these cigarettes and I didn't smoke cigarettes. So I was coughing and hacking on it and crying. And it was just an awful, awful feeling for me because like the sense of loss and like knowing that I would never see this person again who was like my life. I could see the emotional connection between me and the, the lunch maid because, you know, it's someone you love and, you know, you always think they're going to be there. And when they're gone, it's just like it's heart wrenching. It is. It is. Especially, um, I mean, a child never expects to lose um, a parent. So I can't even, especially so suddenly too, Ben, I am, that is devastating. Oh yeah. It, you know, it was a long, long time ago, but you know, pain never goes away because it's your, it's your family, you know? Of course, of course. And I mean, you'll, like you said, like this was the most important person in your life. And I mean, she's still with you every day. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, and I have fond, fond memories of me and my mom watching wrestling and her put me in a headlock and like joking with me. And like, we were really close. Like she was like the person, like I'd come home after being drunk to come watch like the Dukes of Hazzard with, I'd leave a party and walk trashed all the way home to sit with my mother and watch the Dukes of Hazzard. Oh my God. That's like a nice memory though. Oh, hundred percent. That's what I'm saying. I could, could relate, I could relate to the loss of this woman because like, and I, I hope it never happens to anybody out there. If you're really close with your, your parents or your siblings, I hope, God that they, they, they're there for a long time and you can be with them because like it's just the worst feeling to know that you know, you were shorted that's how you feel you feel you were shorted yeah and I think and I think too like to not have that kind of like closure that kind of like moment of like catharsis also can be very like yeah it can be incredibly difficult and painful yeah so like like I said this movie's really really good like it it's got a lot of parts to it where you're like oh my god you know and like you know, I watched it and it was rough. I couldn't watch it with my wife because, like I said, with her dad. So the part with that kid's dad, that might be, like, too much for her. So, but, yeah, it is a great movie. Uh, don't let me, like, my, what I was sharing that because it's a personal thing. And I thought, you know, it, it fit with the movie. So It does fit with so, the movie. So don't, like, not see this movie. It's a beautiful movie. Oh, see this movie. Because we're talking a lot, we're pulling out a lot of the sad points because those are some of the major story points of it. But this movie is incredibly funny. Like, you will laugh. Oh, yeah. It was, there was so many parts in this where you crack up laughing. Like, I was talking about the bar scene. And then there's a part when they're eating dinner and uh, they're all together. And he pulls out the, the whiskey. And, you know, and, like, it's, just, it's, it's really funny. It's really funny. Like, the fact that he has, like, 45 copies of the same book that he, like, gives out as, like, gifts every year. And, like, I don't know. There, this mo- Paul Giamatti is very funny. His little one-liners are very funny. Yeah, 100%. I, I, like I said, there's, uh, what's the part when he's, he's dropping her off at her sister's house in, in Cambridge? Yeah. And, um, or or like a Roxbury, something Roxbury. like that. It was like you know, someplace I've been to uh, in my travels. Uh, it, but it's like, it, was, it was funny. Like He makes a couple of comments to her, and she makes a couple of smart comments back. But at the end, like you know, they're going to miss each other. They're going to miss each other. And then that's actually a beautiful moment. Um, she goes to see her sister because her sister's pregnant. And you kind of see them like setting up like the baby room together. And you kind of see this like sadness in her eyes of like, oh, like you're starting your life with your son and I've just lost my son. And it was this really beautiful moment of like how like family does come together and like sisters are like connected. And um, it, I, I thought it was fin- phenomenally done. Yeah. And didn't like, she like like name the baby um a part of the baby's name like the middle name like after, after him yeah. yeah so so it was really beautiful absolutely watch this movie it was nominated for best um best picture uh best supporting actress which it won best actor which it did not win but it, it, it got a lot of praise um it's a phenomenal movie i don't know if it's the best movie to watch now in the springtime to me it definitely it is set around christmas time so it's much more like wintery vibes yeah thanksgiving break thanksgiving break yeah. yeah christmas so i think um watching it in that time i know it's a long time to wait um but i think it would have more of an impact if you're a first time viewer viewer but absolutely watch it i know it's playing for free on peacock i believe yes it's on peacock um so if you guys have that watch that obviously if you want to rent it though rent it it's absolutely worth the money i don't think um I, yeah i would i would pay i mean i paid to see this movie in theater so i would obviously pay for it again yeah i bought it so yeah cuz it's so good yeah 100% it was worth it it was absolutely worth it it really does feel very new england um it has a lot of new england vibes it was funny a lot of movies were set in boston this year um, this being one of them, American Fiction, which was also nominated for 
Um, an Academy Award was also set like in the Boston area. I just saw a rom-com, Anyone But You, that was also set in Boston for a little bit. Like Boston's kind of everywhere right now. Well, I do know that like for a little bit, Boston was, like, was a really hard place to come to because of um, how much they charged. Mm. But um, they had dropped all that like charging and, and everything to get the movie companies Moving to back. come here you know it was after uh what was that black friday yeah um so like black friday was filmed here there was a bunch of movies that were filmed here. black friday was actually filmed in lynn uh at the old hawthorne restaurant in downtown lynn uh it was one of the scenes so for me i was like oh hometown pride but yeah so like boston has made it so like it's more like substantial for companies to come here and film here now yeah which is good i mean i love i love it i love seeing it absolutely watch this movie it's so good. Pa- Everything about this movie is heartwarming and amazing, even though it's also emotionally devastating. Yes, it's the best of both worlds. It really is. Absolutely watch it. I can't praise this movie enough. Um, this was this has been a great year for movies, and I think the, um, the Academy Awards really showcase that. There are so many great performances, so many great films. We're going to talk about a few more that have really done well this season. So catch us next time on What's Happening.